Yeah, the visual system is amazing. We're mostly visual animals to navigate, survive. Humans mainly rely on vision, not smell or something else. But um, it's a filter for cognition, and it's a it's a strong driver of cognition. Maybe just because it came up, and then uh, we're moving to higher level concepts. Just the the way the visual system works can be summarized in a um, in a few relatively succinct statements. Unlike most of what I've said, which has not been succinct at all. Let's go there. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the what's, retina. What's involved? Yeah. So the retina is this three layers of neuron structure at the back of your eye. It's about as thick as a credit card. It is a piece of your brain. And sometimes people think I'm kind of wriggling by out of a reality by saying that. It is, it's absolutely a piece of the brain. It's, it's a forebrain structure that in the first trimester, there's a genetic program that made sure that that neural retina, which is part of your central nervous system, was squeezed out into what's called the embryonic eye cups. And that the bone formed with a little hole where the optic nerve is gonna connect it to the rest of the brain. And those that window, into the world is the only window into the world for a, for a mammal, which has a thick skull. Birds have a thin skull, so their pineal gland sits, and lizards too, and snakes actually have a hole so that light can make it down into the pineal directly and entrain melatonin rhythms for time of day and time of year. Humans have to do all that through the eyes. So three layers of neurons that are a piece of your brain, their central nervous system, and the optic nerve connects to the rest of the brain. The neurons in the eye, some just care about luminance, just how bright or dim it is. Mm -hmm. And they inform the brain about time of day. And then the central circadian clock informs every cell in your body about time of day and make sure that all sorts of good stuff happens if you're getting light in your eyes at the right times. Mm -hmm. And all sorts of bad things happen if you are getting light randomly throughout the 24 hour cycle. We could talk about all that, but this is a good incentive for keeping a relatively normal schedule, a uh, consistent schedule you of me. light exposure. <laughs> consistent schedule, okay. try and keep a consistent schedule. When you're yeah. young, it's easy to go off schedule and recover. As you get older, it gets harder. But you see everything from outcomes in cancer patients to um, diabetes um, you know, improves when people are getting light at a particular time of day and getting darkness at a particular phase of the 24 hour cycle. We were des designed to um, get light and dark at different times of the, of the circadian cycle. That's all being, all that information is coming in through specialized type of neuron in the retina called the melanops, an intrinsically photosensitive ganglion cell discovered by David Burson at Brown University. That's not spatial information. It's subconscious. You don't think, oh, it's daytime. Even if you're looking at the sun, it doesn't matter. It's a photon counter. It's literally mm -hmm. counting photons. Mm -hmm. And it's saying, oh, even though it's a cloudy day, lots of photons coming in. Ah, it's winter in Boston. It must be winter. And your system is a little depressed. It's spring. You feel alert. That's not a coincidence. That's these melanops and cells signaling the circadian clock. There are a bunch of other neurons in the eye that signal to the brain, and they mainly signal the presence of things that are lighter than background or darker than background. So a black object would be darker than background, a light object lighter than background. And that all come, it's mainly a, it's looking at pixels mainly. It's, it, they look at circles and those neurons have receptive fields, which not everyone will understand, but those neurons respond best to little circles of dark light or little circles of bright light. Mm -hmm. Little circles of red light versus little circles of green light or blue light. And so it, it sounds very basic. It's like red, green, blue, and circles brighter or dimmer than what's next to it. But that's mm -hmm. basically the only information that's sent down the optic nerve. Mm -hmm. And when we say information, we can be very precise. I don't mean little bits of red traveling down the optic nerve. I mean spikes, neural action potentials mm -hmm. in space and time, which for you is like makes total sense. But I think for a lot of people, it's, uh, it's actually beautiful to think about all that information in the outside world is converted into a language that's very simple. It's just like a few syllables, if you will. Mm -hmm. And those syllables are being shouted down the optic nerve, converted into a totally different language, like Morse code. Mm -hmm. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah. Goes into the brain, and then the thalamus essentially responds in the same way that the retina does. Except the thalamus is also weighting things. It's saying, you know what? That thing um, was moving faster than everything else, or it's brighter than everything else. So that signal I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna allow up to cortex. Or that signal is much redder than it is green. So I'm gonna let that signal go through. That signal is much, eh, it's kind of more like the red next to it, throw that out. Mm. The information just doesn't get up into your cortex. And then in cortex, of course, is where perceptions happen. And in V1, if you will, visual area one, but also some neighboring areas, you start getting representations of things like 
oriented lines. So there's a neuron that responds to this angle of my hand versus vertical, mm -hmm. right? This is the defining work of Hubel and Wiesel's Nobel. And it's a very systematic map of orientation, line orientation, direction of movement, and so forth. And that's pretty much end color. And that's how the visual system is organized all the way up to the cortex. So it's hierarchical. You don't build, I want to be clear, it's hierarchical because you don't build up that line by suddenly having a neuron that responds to lines mm -hmm. in a, some random way. It responds to lines by taking all the dots that are aligned in a mm -hmm. vertical stack, and they all converge on one neuron, and then that neuron responds to vertical lines. So it's not random. There's no abstraction at that point, in fact. In fact, if I showed you a black line, I could be sure that if I were imaging V1, that I would see a representation of that black line as a vertical line somewhere in, in your cortex. So at that point, uh, it's absolutely concrete. It's not abstract. Mm -hmm. But then things get really mysterious. Some of that information travels further up into the cortex so that, and goes from one visual area to the next, to the next, to the next. So that by the time you get into an area that um, Nancy Canwisher at MIT has studied her much of her career, the fusiform face area, you set, start finding single neurons that respond only to your father's face or to Joe Rogan's face, regardless of the orientation of his face. I'm sure if you saw Joe, because you know him well, from across the room and you just saw his profile, you'd be like, oh, that's Joe. Walk over and say hello. The orientation of his face isn't there. You wouldn't even see his eyes necessarily, but he's represented in some abstract way by a neuron mm -hmm. that actually would be called the Joe Rogan neuron or it collection might, of neurons. It, it might have limits. Like I might not recognize him if he was upside down or something like that. It'd be fascinating to to see what the limits of that Joe Rogan concept is. So Nancy's lab has done that because early on she was challenged by people that said, there aren't face neurons. Right. There are neurons that they only respond to space and time, shapes and things like that, moving in particular directions and orientations. And it turns out she, Nancy was right. Um, they use these stimuli called Griebel stimuli, which um, any computer programmer would appreciate, which kind of morphs a face into something gradually yeah. that eventually just looks like this like alien thing they call the Griebel. Mm -hmm. And the neurons don't respond to Griebels. In most cases, they only respond to faces and familiar faces. Anyway, I'm summarizing a lot of literature and forgive me, Nancy, and for those of the Griebel people, if there are anything like, you don't come after me with pitchforks. If you come, yeah. Actually, you know what? Come after me with pitchforks. I think you know what I'm trying to do here. Yeah. So the point is that in the visual system, it's very concrete up until about visual area four, yeah. which has color pinwheels and seems to respond to pinwheels of colors. And, um, and so the stimuli become more and more elaborate, mm -hmm. but at some point, you depart that concrete representation and you start getting abstract representations that can't be explained by simple point-to-point -point wiring. Mm -hmm. And to take a leap out of the visual system to the higher level concepts, what we talked about in the visual system maps to the auditory system where you're encoding what? Frequency of tone, sweeps. Mm -hmm. So this is gonna sound weird to do, but you know, uh, like a Doppler, like hearing mm -hmm. something, a car passing by mm -hmm. for instance. But at some point, you get into motifs of music that can't be mapped to just a, a, a what they call a tonotopic map of frequency. You start abstracting. And if you start thinking about concepts of creativity and love and memory, like what is the map of memory space? Right. Well, your memories are very different than mine, but presumably there's enough structure at the early stages of memory processing or at the early stages of emotional processing or at the earlier stages of creative processing that you have the building blocks, your zeros and ones, if mm -hmm. you will, but you depart from that eventually. Now, the exception to this, and I want to be really clear because I was just mainly talking about neocortex the six layered structure on the outside of the brain that explains a lot of human abilities, other animals have them too, is that subcortical structures are a lot more like machines. It's more plug and chug. And what I'm talking about is the machinery that controls heart rate and breathing and receptive fields, um, you know, neurons that respond to things like temperature on the top of my left hand. And one of the, you know, I came into neuroscience from a more of a perspective of initially of psychology, but one of the reasons I forced upon myself to learn some electrophysiology, not a ton, but enough, and some molecular biology and about circuitry is that one of the most beautiful experiences you can have in life, I'm convinced, is to lower an electrode into the cortex and to show 
a person or an animal, you do this ethically, of course, a <laughs> stimulus, yes. like an oriented line or a face. And you can convert the recordings coming off of that electrode into an audio signal, an audio monitor, and you can hear what they call hash. It's not the hash you smoke, it's the hash you hear. And it's it sounds like, <sighs> it just sounds like noise. Mm -hmm. And in the cortex, eventually you find a stimulus that gets the neuron to spike and fire action potentials that are converted into an auditory stimulus that are very concrete, crack. Crack, crack, sounds like a bat cracking, you know, like home runs, you know, or, or outfield balls. When you drop electrodes deeper into the thalamus or into the hypothalamus or into the brainstem areas that control breathing, it's like a machine. You never hear hash. You mm -hmm. drop the electrode down. This could be like a, like a grungy old tungsten electrode, mm -hmm. not high fidelity electrode. As long as it's got a little bit of insulation on it, you plug it into an audio monitor, it's picking up electricity and if it's a visual neuron and it's in the thalamus or the retina and you walk in front of that animal or person, that, mm -hmm. that neuron goes, and then you walk away and it stops. And you put your hand in front of the eye again and it goes, and you could do that for two days. And that neuron will just, every time there's a stimulus, it fires. So whereas before it's a question of how much information is getting up to cortex and then these abstractions happening where you're creating these ideas, when you go subcortical, Everything is. There's no abstraction. It's two plus two equals four. There's no <laughs> abstraction.